Amen. Thank you, Brent. You know, theological controversy is not something that's new. You know, false teaching was actually already creeping into the church even before the New Testament was finished. That's why so many of the, the there are so many warnings in the New Testament about false teaching. Of course, as we think about kind of controversy and, and, and things being addressed and, and maybe even changed and things, the Reformation uh, in, in the 1500s was probably the, well, the most well-known controversy in the history of the church. But as we think about it, there's really probably not a single doctrine in the Bible that hasn't at some point uh, been under scrutiny and been part of controversy. Like even the doctrine of the Trinity, there's been controversy about that. Christology, who is Jesus? What did He do exactly? Right, The deity, the virgin birth, the, the sinlessness, the meaning and the extent of the atonement. What Was He God? Was He man? Was He some combination uh, depravity has been controversial. The human will, do we have free will, yes or no? That's been controversy. Of course, Calvinism, the, the doctrine of election is, is always controversial. And that, that even goes all the way back to uh, Augustine and Pelagius back in, like I think, the 200s. The inerrancy of Scripture comes up often as a, as a controversy. How, how should the church be structured? What is the Lord's Supper? What about baptism, evolution versus a six-day creation, complementarianism, and women pastors, or all of that. And that's before we even get to eschatology, dispensationalism, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, panmillennial. You know, it'll all pan out in the end, right? That's what a lot of people want to just leave it there. And then we get to cessationism versus continuationism, which is kind of where we are in chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians, or as Paul labels it in chapter 12, verse 1, spiritualities. That's the, that's the word, that's the Greek word that he used in, in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, which really should say spiritual things, uh, but we of course know he's referring to spiritual gifts. That's why uh, almost every translation says spiritual gifts, because that's clearly what we're talking about. But really, this whole section, all three of these chapters, chapter 12 and 13 and 14, all three of these chapters are about the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And God wants us to be knowledgeable about these things. When it comes to the Spirit and what He does and how He works, uh, the Lord wants us to be educated, not ignorant. He wants us to be wise, and He wants us to rightly understand and rightly pursue what we would label as the Spirit-filled life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's really what we're talking about, right? We're talking about this abundant, Spirit-filled life. And for that to really happen... You, you cannot be ignorant about spiritual things because the Lord wants us to have abundant life. He wants us to live the Spirit-filled life. He wants us to live joyful Christian lives. And to that end, He gave us various gifts. He's designed us to be interdependent upon one another. He's intended and, and planned that we would be interconnected and that our lives would, would be interwoven with one another and that that would be increasing over time. And we need to not only recognize that, but we need to acknowledge it and pursue it. And that really is the point of the, of the gifts. It's unity, it's interdependence, it's to remind us that you need the body and the body needs you. We need one another. We're, we're intended to play a distinct and unique role in one another's lives. And that happens even when we don't see it, even when we're not always aware of it. You know, there's a song that we sing you know, fairly often. Um, and I love the words because they, they so well describe and define this idea. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. And it's a reflection of what's going on in the Trinity. And the, the, one of the last verses I love, it says, When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain. Then it says, But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. I mean, that's a beautiful description of what the body of Christ is supposed to be and what the, the work of the Spirit in giving us gifts is supposed to accomplish. And the biggest problem that the Corinthians had, he's been addressing problems for, for 13 chapters now, the biggest problem that they had was a lack of love. 
He's corrected this and that and the other. He's been just correction, correction, correction. They probably feel really beat down by now, but that's their problem, right? They weren't loving each other as they should have been. They weren't fulfilling what we know as the one another's of the Bible. It, it was said this, I've heard this said, um, it's easier to be orthodox than to be loving, you know, it's, it's easy to know theology. You can read the books, you can memorize all the stuff, but it's much harder to live in the reality of that, to, to love people, to fulfill it, to live in response to that. And, and so here we are, right in the middle of this really intense chunk of correction of verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. In, in verse 12, he's basically said, you've received the gifts, and FYI, you're doing it very wrong. And then in chapter 14, he's going to come in and say, this is how you should be exercising them. But there's a little bit of a, almost a pause kind of right here in the middle in chapter 13. Now remember, at the end of chapter 12, it concluded with not just correction, but then saying, I will yet show you a more excellent way. And that paradigm, that, that foundation that is now going to be laid in, in chapter 13 is more excellent. What he's going to tell us about here is much better. It's better than having one of the so-called greater gifts. It's better than thinking of yourself as superior to other people because of what God has given to you or done in your life. It's much better, especially, than feeling inferior because, well, my gift isn't that important. It's not as, as, as noticeable as other. It's so much better than all the nonsense that had been going on continuously in the Corinthian church. And, and this really is what we're, the core of what we're looking at this morning is the description of the Spirit-filled life. This is what the abundant life that Jesus came that we should have is to look like. And, and, and unfortunately, it's something that can be faked. You can fake it to other people. You can fake it to yourself, at least for a time. I don't think you can fake it permanently. <laughs> the parable of the soils demonstrates that this can be, it can, it can be a false version of that, right? You know, in the parable of the soils, we have, you know, the weeds the, the, the growing up quickly, but then there's no root and it falls away. Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 Samuel 16 tells us that Yahweh looks at the heart not at the actions. There's many other examples, of course, in, in Revelation, uh, addressing all the different churches. It's, all, it's a lot of correction there as well. So how do we really know if we're living the Spirit-filled life? If we're living this walking in the Spirit life, how do, we, how do we know, first for ourselves, how do we self-evaluate, am I really living this out? Or, or how do we discern it in other people? Because I think we're supposed to do that as well. How can we know? Can we know? Or is it just something that's invisible? Well, Jesus in Matthew 17 said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Okay, so, so Jesus says we can know. Matthew 12, he goes on to say, The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So you'll know by, by what they do and what they say. If someone is walking in genuine love, you'll hear it coming out of their mouth. You'll see it as a result of what they're doing. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You will know them by their fruits. And truthfully, it's only through the work of the Spirit in our hearts that we can pursue any of this, that we can do or accomplish any of this. It's only the power that the Spirit provides to believers that gives us the motivation and the ability for true spiritual living, to walk in the Spirit. And, and counterfeit living, someone who's faking this either to themselves or to others, counterfeit living is counterproductive to genuine spiritual life. And only when we're walking in the Spirit will there be real spiritual fruit. And fruit is the result of the Spirit-filled life. So what is walking in the Spirit? What is the Spirit-filled life? Well, I want to give you a couple of things to kind of frame that before we jump into the passage this morning. And if, you, if you're writing things down, right, there's a couple of verses I want you to write down that you need to keep, keep in the front of your mind. One is Colossians 3.16, which says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. With all wisdom, and, and the result of that will be teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. So there's, a, there's an evidence and there's a fruit of that that happens when you gather with, with believers. 
The starting point, of course, is the word dwelling richly into you. I've always used the phrase, or for many years I've used the phrase, saturated in God's word. I think that's a good way to put it, soaking it in. And Colossians 3 is distinctly connected to Ephesians 5, which says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then we're told to be filled with the Spirit. So there's this connection between walking in the Spirit and the Spirit-filled life, which is a word-saturated life. 2 Peter 1.3 goes on to say, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of Him. Meaning you have, you have everything you need in the Spirit and, and everything you need in the Spirit through the Word of God. What you need is not more of the Spirit. What you actually need is more saturation in the Word. And, and the cool thing is, is the more you saturate yourself in the Word, the, the more you become aware of the work of the Spirit in your life. And, and as that happens, you'll become less and less interested in the things of the world that don't lead to sanctification. It's this beautiful process. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word, the Bible, is truth. So the spirit, spiritual life, the spirit-filled life, the walking in the spirit life is about being scripture-saturated, being obedient. Uh, it becomes about living life quorum Deo, right? Which, which means to live before the face of God under His authority, and to His glory. And, and the Corinthians were doing the exact opposite of that. They had the gifts, but there was no fruit because they weren't living life of Coram Deo. They weren't walking in obedience. And of course, the biggest problem was the lack of love, which brings us to our passage for this morning. And so as we read, um, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13 if you haven't. Uh, and when we read, we're going to back up one verse and we're going to start with 12, for chapter 12, verse 31, because that's what leads us into this chapter. So I'd invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. This is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, into chapter 13. This is the Word of the Lord. But you earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I will yet show you a more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing and if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Does not brag. Is not puffed up. It does not act unbecomingly. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child and think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for this we thank you for this chapter, uh, right? Kind of breaking in here into the middle of, of the correction. And, and, and there's still some pointing out, there's still correction here. But Lord, then there's just this beautiful uh, explanation of what love is. So as we look at this, Lord, I pray that you would impact our lives with it, that, that we would hear it in our heads and that it would, it, would, it would impact our hearts and that it would be seen in our hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So we're talking this morning about love, about agape love, to, to be absolutely clear. And, and this particular word, it's the Greek word agape or agapeo, it's actually a fairly rare word in Greek literature. When you look at ancient Greek literature, you don't see this word very often. But in the New Testament, 
it's, it's there again and again and again and again. It's very common in the New Testament. Now, it's what it is not, and, and this is one of the, um, the, I guess, the deficiencies of the English language, is we have one word, whereas they have several words for love. This is not romantic love, like the love between a husband and wife. It, it's not a, not a sentimental love. It, it's not just a, a love that brings pleasant feelings or that, that feels right. It's not brotherly love, the love of friendship that you would have. That's phileo. This is agape love. It's the highest love. It's the love that God has for us. And it's the love that we can only truly have through the Spirit of God. It is a gift that the Spirit gives us. And we can only live rightly with this kind of love when we're walking in the Spirit. And this, this is actually true love. Not what you hear about in the Princess Bride. That's a whole different kind of thing. This, this, is, this is true love. This is agape love. It's a self-giving love. It's a love that is primarily concerned with giving rather than receiving. This is John 3.16 love. This is sacrificial love. This is a love that gives up its own personal interest for the sake of someone else. It's not a feeling. It's not something that just happens accidentally either. It's not an accidentally in love kind of thing. This is a determined act of the will. It's an intentionally pursued action. It's purposeful giving of self. It puts the welfare of other people over your own. And it does it joyfully, gladly. There's no pride, vanity, arrogance, or selfishness in this love. This is a love that is even directed at your enemies. It's, 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 it's a love that, that, that pursues humility and willingly. It doesn't do things begrudgingly. It demonstrates itself in practical, obvious ways. And if you want one of those, look at Jesus, right? He, who washed the feet of his disciples. One of the lowliest things that you could do in that time. It, it, this love is the supreme mark of discipleship. There's no substitute for this love. Theology, knowledge, all the religious activity in the world will not be a substitute or a replacement for this kind of love. And, and like holiness, like salvation, again, you can't manufacture this love on your own. You can't just stir it up within you because you kind of figured it out at some point along the way. You can't self-generate it. It's something that comes to you from the Spirit of God. It's not something that you can just kind of finally put it all together and figure it out. According to the Bible and what we see in many different places, this is a love that is poured into you. But at the same time, it's a love that you have to put on. It's something that you can increase in. And it's something that we express and demonstrate toward one another. We're commanded to be fervent in this kind of love. We're, we're told to be unified in love. And we're called to stimulate and stir one another up toward a greater amount of this kind of a love. And the truth is, if this love is not the driving force behind your serving, behind your actions, behind what you're doing in the church, and, and your attitudes toward other people, and even spilling over into the rest of your life outside of the church, if this is not the foundational aspect of your interactions with others, what the passage tells us, it will be empty. Right? If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. And that just means annoying and loud and obnoxious and frustrating. Something I don't want to hear but can't not hear because it just assaults me. I'm essentially forced to put up with it. And you can have all of the so-called greater gifts. And without love, it's pointless. You can speak, it says, with the tongues of men and angels. And languages is probably actually a better word here than, than tongues. But, you know, and these, this phrase with the tongues of men and angels, these are terms about, about being able to just speak eloquently, to communicate well. This, this, there, this is not like a special language. There's a, you can speak like an angel so beautifully, so eloquently, so hypnotically that people just can't stop listening. You, you, need, you can be someone who whenever they stand up and start to speak, everybody is just drawn to listen. I can remember what, about 25, 30 years ago, I remember the, the, when E.F. Hutton talked, people listen. You know, they have these, the, you know, all these people in a restaurant talking, da, 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 and somebody says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and he says, everybody in the restaurant stops, and they turn and they listen. You could be the guy that everybody's like, I can't wait for him to speak because I want to hear what he has to say, please. That, that's what this is talking about. This isn't, and there's no biblical warrant to say this is some special language of angels. In fact, when we look at all of the interactions in the Bible between angels and humans, 
they always speak in human language. People understand what the angels are saying. There's not even a hint of a reference to this actual different language that only the angels speak. This simply means beautiful, eloquent speaking. Someone who when they stand up is like, give me more, keep talking, I love to hear you speak. And if you're doing that, if that's you, great. But if you're not doing it from a place of love, then you're doing it wearing a mask. It's fake. You're trying to speak from a place other than love. And, and when that is the case, no matter what gift you have, no, no matter how involved you are in the church, no matter how many ministries you serve in, no matter how many times you showed up in a row without missing, and, and no, e- even if you're here every time the doors are unlocked, it's hollow and it's empty and it's not going to help anyone. You can claim to be the most faith-filled person ever. You, 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 can, you can be convinced that you trust God more than anyone that you know. You could be the biggest most generous person anyone knows. You, you, could, you could go to different homeless ministries every week and serve in one on Monday and another one on, or on Tuesday and then on Wednesday I go to the other one and on Thursday I go downtown and all of that. You, you could even take this all the way to being persecuted for your faith, being murdered for your faith. And if you're not doing it out of the right kind of love, it will be useless. There will be no spiritual benefit to you It won't earn you a single thing. Oh, you might get some accolades here on earth. But it'll have no benefit in eternity and ultimately no benefit to the church. It won't advance the kingdom of God. It'll be a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. All of your efforts will be pointless. And if you have just heard this after them describing you, wow. This is, this is intense. This, this is a high level calling out. He's saying all the stuff that you've been doing, all the preaching, all the, all the serving, all the eloquent theology, all of the mountain moving faith that you've been expressing in God, all of your giving, all of your serving the poor, all of the suffering that you've been enduring out there in the public for the sake of Christ. If, if it wasn't done out of the right kind of love, it is literally nothing and you're wasting your time. And so to the people thinking, well, I'm the most spiritual person here. He's saying, no, you're not. And this, I think, would have been devastating for many to hear. And it needed to be. They needed to be shaken up. But then it gets good. Right? So th- these verses, when we get to verse 4, the love is patient, love is kind, that thing, have been called by, by many different people the most beautiful Words in all of literature. And there's 15 descriptions here of what love is and what love isn't. And I think after the devastation of these first three verses, you know, prophecy, mysteries, faith, moving mountains, giving everything away, surrendering my body to be burned, speaking with eloquence that nobody else has, that's all nothing? He he devastates them and then he comes in He doesn't leave them there with this beautiful description of what love is. And and, and understand and know these are all verbs. That's one of the best parts about this, right? We we need to see on the front end before we even start looking at any of these characteristics, any of these qualities of love. It's not what love is or isn't. It's what love does or doesn't do. Agape love is an active doing thing. It's not passive. It's not just feelings. It's not just emotions. It's not just things that you feel. These are things you put into practice. 1 John 3.18, Jesus said, Let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. So this is what you do. And the, the truth, the in truth means this is the overflow of your heart. It starts with, with who you are, and it's not just words. It's actions. It becomes the product of who you are. And so what we're doing this morning as we look at these words, this passage, we're not doing a technical analysis of love. What we're doing is our goal is to truly understand what love is and apply it to our lives so that we love others in a right way. So it's not nothing. <laughs> so it does profit. So it's not a noisy gong or clanging cymbal, but this beautiful sound. We have to determine to be these things by doing what we're told to do here. And that has to come out of an overflow of your heart. 
And, and of course, our first goal must be for the Word to change us, right? The living, active, sharp, piercing, dividing Word that is able to judge our thoughts and the intentions of our heart and lay them bare and bring change. So make no mistake, the goal this morning is to bring transformation to your life. And, and I, you know, a radical transformation, maybe, or just some tweaks, maybe. But we want to get these 15 characteristics of agape love into our head so that it can grip our heart and it can be seen through our hands and all of our words and actions and deeds and attitudes toward one another. Colossians 1.19, it's the, the prayer that, that we should be praying for other people. It, it's so relevant in this, right? We want our head to be filled with and multiplying in this knowledge. And we want to please Him. That's the heart. That's where God evaluates us. And we want to walk in a worthy manner. That's the hands. That's the, the moving. That's bearing fruit. That's being joyful and thank, thanking God. That's what comes out. And just a little detail I'll throw in for free. The best example of any of this is Jesus. He is the perfect doer of all of these things. And so keep that in mind. So we're looking this morning at 15 qualities of agape love. And yes, you can consider it a checklist. It's not a mechanical checklist. It's not just like that, 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 that. But ask yourself at every point, with every one of these, is does this describe me? Am I this? Does this describe how I'm interacting with others. As I look at these and I think, think about these, does this describe how I behave toward my spouse, toward my children, ouch, toward my parents, extended family, coworkers, friends? Is this how I treat them? Is this how I treat everyone that I encounter every day? Because these 15 things should be the overwhelming testimony of your life. And yes, this is often quoted at weddings, and it absolutely should be. It's very appropriate to read this at a wedding, but it cannot stop there. This isn't just about how you love your wife or how you love your husband. This is how you love everyone. These are the qualities that should be obvious in every aspect of your life. So let's look at these, and we're just going to walk through these one at a time. And be thinking about how does this describe you? Number one, patient. Love is patient. And, okay, and I'll just tell you, I'm in trouble already. We're, we're, we're barely finished saying the first one. And I, I, we're all in trouble, right? To be patient is to be long-tempered. And really, this is about being patient with people. Not just patient with the situation, but patient with the person. In the midst of the situation. And ultimately, this means you're not going to retaliate. Which, let's be honest, that's what we want to do. Every time, right away, right? Patience. You know, I, I know I'm, you're not going to do that. I knew a guy one time who, when he went to a restaurant and, and sat down, and, and as the waiter or waitress comes over, he would put some money on, on the corner of the table. And he would say to them, as they come, oh, thank you, yeah, yeah. Right here, this is your tip. Now, it can either increase or decrease, depending on how things go while we're here. So he's essentially announcing on the front end, I'm not going to be patient with you or with anything. I mean, that's a terrible attitude. No patience. I mean, let's even think about this. How many times do you have to remind your children to put their shoes away? Or this, that, or the other. Or when you're done with that, put it away. Put it back. Okay, yeah, there's... Okay, again, we're not... Probably as patient as we should be. I find it also interesting that in Roman culture, patience was not a virtue that was held in high esteem. In fact, Aristotle, it was considered weakness. Aristotle said, you need to strike back at offenses. And he went on to say, vengeance is a virtue. Which is like the opposite of patience. But look at Acts chapter 7. Stephen, he was patient. 2 Corinthians talks a lot about and shows us the patience of Paul. Ephesians 4 even speaks about the community of believers need to be patient with one another. 2 Peter 3, God Himself is patient with us. Thank goodness for that. Luke 23 even shows us that forgiveness flows out of patience. And think about this, okay? God is constantly wronged and rejected and blasphemed and maligned and His patience is constant and ongoing. And I know that I am absolutely abundantly thankful for His patience with me. Not just this last week, 
but for all of my life. Certain, especially certain periods of time that we look at, right? So the question really ultimately is that you need to ask yourself is, am I being patient with so-and-so? Whoever, whoever it is you're talking to, fill in the blank. Am I being patient with them right now? That's the starting point of having the right kind of love towards somebody else. Patient. And then connected to patience, number two, is kind. It just goes right along with it. They, they flow together. They're, they're intertwined like, like branches that can't be uh, separated from each other. And they actually shouldn't be separated, right? You can't separate out these different qualities and say, okay, well, I'm going to be patient today. And then tomorrow I'll, I'll work on being kind. And then, ooh, you know what? That's good because I don't have to be patient again for two weeks. That, that's not how this works. They, they all go together. We do look at them individually, but they go together. To be kind is essentially to be useful. It's about graciously serving other people. It's active goodwill. Generosity is what goes in here. This is working for the welfare of others. Matthew 5, uh, if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your garment also. That's what kindness is. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Romans 2 gives us a beautiful picture of kindness. Do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness, God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Wow, if God's kindness leads to repentance, then my kindness must be important. Titus 3, when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. When Jesus said in Matthew, my yoke is easy, He's referring to, to kindness. That's what He was talking about. So do you act in kindness toward other people? What about those closest to you? What about the people that just aggravate you more than anyone you know? Are you acting in kindness toward them, the people that are constantly on your nerves? The bottom line, this is just being helpful to other people. Kindness is not a mystery. It's not hard to understand how to be kind to other people. So are you being kind? Number three is not jealous. Now we're getting into some, some not this, not this, not this. Love is on one side and, and jealousy stands on the other side and cancels it out. Your jealousy will cancel out your, your lovingness. And really there's two forms that jealousy takes kind of, kind of two forms. And they're both evil. They're both wicked. One is I want what they have. Like, man, that's a nice car. I want that car. I, and and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I have failed in this area. When I was in seminary, I, I drove a 1979 Volvo station wagon that was given to me. Like, here are the keys. It's yours. So that right away tells you a little bit about this car. It had a stick shift, no AC, no heat. And, 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 and the radio not only did not work, but it was just kind of sitting in there. I don't know how it wasn't ever stolen. At some point along the way, I was rolling, trying to roll the window up, and it stopped rolling up. So now I have a car with no heat, no AC, uh, no radio, and the window doesn't roll all the way up. The driver's window, mind you. And then I would drive by the local high school student parking lot and see BMW, Porsche, Mercedes. That is the nicest truck I've ever seen. And I would think, I want that car. Like, why do they, why does a 16 year old have a brand new BMW and I'm driving a 1979 Volvo station wagon with nothing, right? There's actually a lot more to the, to the Volvo story, ask me later. But that, that's, that's the first thing I want what they have. And the second part, the second, second side of jealousy is this thing of I want bad for them. So that's like not just I want the BMW, but you know what would be really nice and satisfying? If they had a wreck, and I don't want anybody to get hurt, but if they, if they somehow totaled that BMW and then had to drive my Volvo, that would be satisfying. Those are the two sides of jealousy. I want what they have, and then I want bad for them. It's this flesh, spirit, battle, and the word zeal or means strong desire. That's the same root word. So, so don't be that. And that's hard. The command is to not be like that. When you see someone successful, someone that's achieved something, they finally attained this, this goal, whether it be wealth or skill or success or popularity, you actually have to be happy for them. You want to be. You should be happy for them. I should have been happy that a 16-year-old is driving a nice car, not thinking, oh, I should be driving that car. That's, that's how we need to be. Philippians 1 talks about these, these other preachers of the gospel that were jealous of Paul. That, that makes no sense. Proverbs 27 talks about jealousy. 
It says, wrath is cruelty and anger is a flood. But who can stand before jealousy? Wow. So jealousy exceeds wrath and cruelty. It's raw. It's visceral. James chapter 3 pits wisdom, pits it against wisdom and understanding. You want a beautiful example of not jealous, what we're supposed to be? Look at David and Jonathan. This beautiful friendship that they had. That's a picture of not jealous. And that's what we need to be is not jealous. Number four is does not brag. And this really is kind of the flip side of jealousy. To, to, to brag is to talk conceitedly. Jealousy says, I want what you have. Bragging says, you want what I have. I'm a show-off. This is what the Corinthians really were. They were show-offs. Oh, you would love to have the gift that I have, right? I mean, really, wouldn't you? I mean, you would. Because how could you not want to be me? How, how could you not want to have the stuff I have? I mean, I'm the gifted, the most gifted person I know. Without me, the church would fall apart. That's what you all want to be, right? But here's something to remember, right? If you have these things, and, and, and maybe you do have a, a great gift, just because it's true, just because you do have that gift, just because you have achieved, doesn't mean it's okay to brag about it. It's not. Don't. What? You're the smartest person in the room? Okay. You don't need to brag about it. It doesn't matter if it's true. Being true doesn't make it okay. The person who is being loving Truly loving, demonstrating this agape love, isn't focused on making sure that everyone else knows that they're the best, this, that, or the other. And just so you know, manipulating the situation so that others make sure everyone knows that you're as good as you are, you're not fooling anyone. You're not fooling God. You can't pull the wool over His eyes. You know, look how great I am. And you know what? Here's the deal. Social media draws this out. It's like, it's almost as if someone intended social media to just draw this kind of thing out of us. Look how wonderful I am. Look at all my posts. All of my posts are about Jesus. You know, look how wonderful I am. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, let's see, what am I going to put? What am I going to make sure is in the background of this picture that I'm about to post on so that people will think it's cool, right? We, that, that's what it is. And, and nothing, there's nothing, I'm not saying you shouldn't have social media. I'm not saying that every post is bragging, but just be aware that it's like, that's what it does. That's inherent in what it is. And then do you ever, have you ever done this? Have you ever uh, played the one-upmanship game in conversations? Like, oh, well, I just got such and such. Really? Oh, well, I'm about to get one that's just a little bit better. Oh, really? I just got the iPhone 14. Oh, I just got the 15. I got a pre-release version of the 16. You should see it. Or whatever. Right, you know, to just to just barely have that advantage over the person, other person, just be a little bit better. That's kind of what that is, and that that's again, these are interwoven. That moves us right to number five: not arrogant, because to be arrogant is to say, "I have arrived. I am there." Raw pride, bragging is a form of this, and it takes it to the next level. I mean, the Corinthians apparently were bragging about everything. You know, their knowledge of doctrine, their amazing gifts. Oh, I, I follow the best of the four pastors. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and he's fantastic and I'm in his camp. And even their carnality and their idolatry, they seem to have this idea that I'm so spiritual, I can even do those things and it doesn't affect me. Well, arrogance is the opposite of a repentant spirit. And never forget that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And no, you are not the humblest person you know. And Proverbs go on and on and on about pride. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone, listen to this, wow. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Ouch. Pride in your heart when there's pride rather than love. Here's what it's going to do. It's going to lead you to contentious behavior because you love yourself more than other people. Because you think so highly of yourself that you're going to do whatever it takes to get your way, to get what you want, because that's the better thing. That's better for everyone to do things. I, I, I'm actually doing it for you. Don't be that. That's not love. And you can convince yourself that you're doing it for other people, but you're not. You're doing it for yourself. True love, agape love, is not arrogant. It's not puffed up. 
Number six is not unbecoming, and this is real simple, not rude, not poor manners, uh, and those are both forms of pride. You know, rudeness, rudeness comes because, well, you don't need to be kind or humble because, well, all the honor is supposed to be coming to me anyway, so it doesn't matter. This is behavior with no grace. Rather than your behavior and the way you act, drawing people in, it pushes them away. That, that's what it means to be unbecoming. And then we hit number seven, self-seeking, or it says in the passage, does not seek its own. And let me just tell you, this is the key to all of it. This stands at the center of the list, and I think that's intentional. And this really, this is the hub that everything revolves around. The root of sin, the root of depravity is seeking self. It's self-focused thinking. It's self-focused behaving, pursuing your own, seeking your own benefit. And this is instinctual for all of us. This is the default. Your flesh is wired to this, to self-seeking. One commentator said this, if you cure selfishness, you can replant Eden. I mean, that'll take us all the way back, right? That's where Adam and Eve went wrong, was selfishness. Philippians 4 tells us what it looks like when you're acting in agape love, not looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And the Corinthians were all seeking themselves. They wanted to be edified. They wanted to be built up, not the church, not other people, me. That's where it was all at. And again, Jesus is the ultimate example. Matthew 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for, for many. So, so the key here in this does not seek His own is to keep your focus on other people. How can, how can they be built up? Not my benefit, their benefit. And, and it will be a constant battle. Because what you want is the things that benefit you. This is so difficult to prioritize the other person because we want what we want because we need, deserve, whatever. Number eight, not provoked. Wow. <laughs> to be provoked is to be roused to anger. It's the idea of a sudden outburst, getting irritated or upset or agitated by something that someone said to you or about you or against you. And we're not talking about righteous indignation where someone speaks poorly of Christ and, and you want to correct that. It, it, it's self-defense. Well, I was only defending myself. I mean, you, what they said was absolutely wrong. You know, This actually follows. There's, the sequence is, is great, right? Not provoked. Why? Because you're not seeking your own. The self-seeking person is easily provoked and ready to retaliate. The flip side is the person that's not self-seeking is not going to be provoked. It, it, you can't have a temper. That's kind of what this is saying. Oh, well, it's my right. I'm going to fight for it because it's my right. No, you don't get to have that attitude. The person who is provoked, you know what? They'll say, oh, I love you. But then they're constantly upset and, and angry because of what you did or what you said or what you didn't do. That's destructive behavior. And the cure for this is to look back one. Does not seek its own. Stop seeking your own. That is a negative thing. You do not do that when you're acting in agape love. To be provoked is natural. So we have to, we have to push back against that natural. And again, only through what the Spirit is doing in our life can we even have the right attitude and approach to this. And then here's where it gets really hard is number nine, not keeping records. If you think about your enemies, this is like an accounting term. Think about your enemies. You can probably think about all the things that they've done against you. So are you keeping records? Are you, are you tracking the wrongs done against you? Well, that's keeping records. That's exactly what is taking into account a wrong suffered. For the believer, you know what? God isn't keeping records Romans 4.8, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. If God is not keeping records of our sins, how can we turn and keep record of what someone else has done? I mean, some people will go so far as to write it down. Don't hold on to resentment. Don't hold on to a grudge. Let it go. Number 10, does not rejoice at unrighteousness. And these really are, in one sense, these are very self-explanatory. You should not get any satisfaction from sin. 
Don't make any effort to justify some bad behavior, sinful behavior, sinful actions. Well, this is why I have that attitude. No, 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 no. Don't justify your own sinful actions or attitudes. Don't try to justify somebody else's sinful actions or attitudes. Romans 1, 28 through 32, the last part of Romans, that chapter 1, gives us a lengthy list of sinful behavior, sinful attitudes, sinful actions. And at the end of the list, the last thing on the list is this. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That means they're rejoicing in that sinful behavior. True agape love will never do that. I mean, think about this. Sin is an affront to God. And if you love God and you're trying to love like God loves, how can you rejoice in something that is offensive to God? The things God hates, we should hate. The things that offend God should offend us. And and let me tell you what is one of the big things in view here. Here's your application for for this one. Gossip. Gossip is rejoicing in unrighteousness. And it doesn't matter if you're the one sharing the gossip or if you're the one hearing the gossip. Both sides are rejoicing in unrighteousness. I mean, that's definitively what it is. I mean, if it was righteousness, it wouldn't be gossip. It would be celebrating. You you, you don't say, hey, did you hear? Joe shared the gospel with Fred, and Fred got saved the other day. How cool is that? No one would call that gossip. But did you hear what Joe did at work the other day and got caught? Really? No, tell me. That's gossip. That's rejoicing in righteousness, both sides. You, You know what? Another version of that? Complaining. Ouch. It's really just another version of that. It takes two to tango. You have the complainer and you have the one listening who is ultimately encouraging and rejoicing in it just by listening to it. Both of these, it's an overflow of the heart. It reveals a lack of agape love in the heart. So don't rejoice in unrighteousness. But number 11, rejoice at the truth. Right? This is presented and this is placed here in contrast to the other one. And actually really from here, we're, we're, we're looking now at positive things. I think Paul wanted to finish the list out that way. Wanted to finish, you know, I've told you what not, he started, this is what love is. Now let me tell you a little bit, a lot of bit of what love isn't. But man, now let's look at these these last ones. And and these last ones build to this beautiful crescendo, right? I think Paul wanted to say, yes, yes, do this, do this, do this. The dynamic gets better and better and it gets more and more joyous as we get to the end. To rejoice in truth is to rejoice in God's Word. For one, John 1.14, the Word became flesh. John 14, Jesus is the truth. John 17, your Word is truth. So to rejoice at the truth requires you to be so saturated in truth that you see it, that you know it, that you, you spot it immediately. You can't ever rejoice in false doctrine. You can't rejoice in compromise. Anything that's not the truth. How do you do that practically? Don't focus on the wrongs of other people. Don't, don't, don't go and parade their faults around. Focus on what is right and what is good. Appreciate the positive. Call attention to the triumphs in just the ordinary mundane things of life. Don't wait for some grand victorious win before you say, hey, good job. Always be ready to encourage. Look for things to rejoice in and do it. Rejoice with them in the big things and the small things. Be ready to jump in and share beautiful truth at any point. Jump at the chance to rejoice with somebody over something. And if you really love someone, this real love you want, you're going to want to encourage them. You're going to want to rejoice with them when something of the truth is going on. When something wonderful has happened. It's going to be on your radar You're not standing ready to call someone out as soon as they do something wrong. You're waiting for something good to point out. Number 12, bears all things. This is getting good. This is so good. This is so needed. 1 Peter 4 says, Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. This idea of bears all things, the idea is it covers, it it, it supports, it protects. The idea here is that you're, you're protecting people from things that are negative like maybe gossip or complaining. Loving others requires protecting them. Proverbs 10, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Do you you want to know how much you really love someone? 
You want to evaluate, do I really love them? How quick are you and how ready are you to cover their faults, their, 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 their weaknesses, their, their, their struggles? And I'm not saying justify their sin. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're covering their faults. We, we're, we're protecting them. We're, we're supporting them. How quick are you to do that and help them bear their burdens? And that's going to look different in every situation with every person. But your love for someone else, a true agape love, should lead to, to protecting them, to bearing with them, to helping them with their weaknesses, to helping them with their struggles. And then believes all things. Number 13, man, you're not suspicious. We sometimes tend to be suspicious of others or, or to be cynical. Uh, you know, I'm protecting them because I'm supposed to protect them. I'm supposed to help them. No, you're protecting them because you really believe the best. You see the best, not the worst. They really are innocent until proven guilty. You're, you want to help them toward repentance. And, and there's a beautiful mutual trust that flows out of this kind of love when we're demonstrating and expressing it toward other people. When we are determined to believe the best about someone, not even listen to gossip, I'm gonna, you're going to have a greater confidence in them. They're going to have a greater confidence in you. Because we're believing all things. And as it, this is, like, this is a, like the good grenade. When you are doing, behaving this way, when you're believing the best, it's like you're throwing a love grenade into the room. Right? You know, we talk about, oh, he just threw a grenade in and walked off. No, this is, this is, this is going to catalyze joy in community when we believe all things. This brings unity. This, this fosters the ties that bind us and ties them even stronger. And then it moves right into number 14, hopes all things. Because failure is never final. We're all going to fail. We're going to fail ourselves. We're going to fail other people. But grace God's grace, agape love, always comes with hope and doesn't give up on them. Peter failed miserably. I mean, can you imagine being Peter? You walk with Jesus every day. You're with Him all day, every day. You saw all the miracles. He, he said, hey, blessed are you. You made the declaration of who I am. And then you say, I, I didn't even know Him when push comes to shove. Can you imagine how devastated he was in that moment? And yet, the agape love of Jesus said that failure is not final. There's still much to be done with you. Think about Israel. I mean, where do you even begin with Israel? <laughs> the Corinthians here, they've messed up. But Paul is hoping all things for these people. Love doesn't see a failure as the final failure. Love has hope for the future and strives for the best for the other person. And number 15, endures all things. And this is where it really comes together, right? Because this points to the security that we have as believers. Because agape love is an enduring love. When you have a true agape love for someone else, you're going to endure hardship. You're going to stand against overwhelming op opposition. This is like a military term. Think about D-Day, right? You know, we've, we've seen, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but you know, the storming the beaches of Normandy. Man, that was like unending opposition. People just dying left and right, and they kept going, kept going, kept going in face of just relentless opposition. That, that's, that's agape love. And when you love someone this way, you give them a tangible example of Christ's love for all of us. You know the song, He Will Hold Me Fast? That's a picture of this. That's the doctrine of perseverance. Agape love bears the unbearable, believes the unbelievable, hopes when everything seems hopeless, and endures when everyone else would give up. This is the unending love of God poured out out on us at the cross. This is the gospel. We, we are the opposite of all of these things here. We're impatient. We're unkind. We're jealous. We're, we're puffed up. We brag about everything. We could go through every single one of these and we have to admit that we have failed miserably. But because God is these things, because His love is all these things, and even when we were unlovable, He loved us and He died for us. I mean, Romans 8 is a wonderful passage, but Romans 5, God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were not only not these things, we're not even worthy of that. Even now, we're not worthy of His love. Even on our best day, your best day, your most sin-free day, which is not sin-free at all, you don't deserve God's love. What we deserve is eternal punishment 
in the lake of fire. What we get when we repent of our sins and place our faith in Christ is forgiveness. When we trust in what Jesus did on the cross, when we trust in His patience and His humility and His kindness, when, when we, when, then we realize He did not seek His own. He came to seek and save the lost. Me! When we look to that, He saves us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He pours out this love into our hearts. And for most of us here, right, that, that's what He has done. But if, you, if you're thinking, looking at these thinking, man, none of this is me. I, I'm not any of this. I don't even get this. Man, then you need to repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ. Because this is what He pours in you. In John 7, as Jesus points out, it, it, it says, He who believes in Me, as the Scripture said, from His innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's part of what He's talking about. Is this love that He pours into you will then pour out into others. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because He loved us first. That's agape love. That's a love that we love God and we love others. And that's what happens. That's, that's just the picture of a Christian. Agape love for other people. So is that you? Or do you need to trust in Him and turn to Him? This is the more excellent way. These are the qualities that need to be present in each one of us. This is right in the middle of this maybe most controversial topic in the Bible. And the heart of what God wants for us, the heart of what the Spirit does in us, in the midst of all of these gifts, is love. The main thing the Spirit pours out in us is the gift that we've all been given, and it's the gift that we must carry out. We love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one does, who does not love his brother whom he has not seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. That's agape love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this love that you have shown to us, this love that, <laughs> that, that you poured out on us and that you also poured in us. And we just pray that all of us would, would come to a deeper understanding of, of your love for us and, and that that would cause us to love others in a greater way. Pray that this would be the love that we have for one another. Pray that even as we go through our week and, and think again through these 15 things, that they, you would bring them to our mind often and, and that we would continually strive to, to love others in an active, intentional, not self-seeking way and, and that that would become who we are, that you would work both in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name.